The very name Menashe in Hebrew means responsible representation. We are we have a principle that the Menashe, we are told, we are told that that Joseph named his son Menashe because God has me, enabled me to forget all of my troubles. So Rabbi Shimshon Raphael Hirsch tells us that this actually means that God made from my troubles uh, a representation, uh, uh, an, an advocate on my behalf, something that through which I would be, be enabled to represent Menashe comes from this root, Noshe, Nasha. This is the root that gives us the word for Gid Hanoshe, for the sciatic nerve that moves, for forgetfulness, Nashia, when something slips or moves from our mind, or moves within our, the retrieval system of our thought process. That is what is forgetfulness, is, that is what forgetting is, it's a movie. So, but nevertheless, it's still attached, it's still there. So to a creditor, it's called Anoshe because he has given something of his own to someone else, but he still remains attached to it. He still has a claim on it. And so to women, women in the plural are noshim and they draw nashim. Uh, you have a ish, a man, and isha, a woman, because a woman is taken from a man. That is in the singular. And in the singular, a man and a woman are, are two parts of the one entity man, woman, and they have an equality. But in the plural, you have nashim. Nashim, according to the Bible or in biblical uh, thought, nashim are also uh, an entity in their own right, an equality to the man, but they give over of their own free will their rights of representation to their husbands. It's as if their husbands in the aggregate, in the plural, are there to represent them. The husbands represent the men, but nevertheless the men have a responsibility. They have to give an, make an, an accounting, as if to say, to the women. They, the women are their notion, are their creditors, are those who have a, a claim on them. And uh, this, all of these words uh, relate to the root Noshe, which is the same root for Menashe. So Rabbi Shimshon Raphael Hirsch says that Menashe in effect means uh, responsible representation. Responsible representation is the principle, is the soul, the psyche, as if to say, of the Americans, of, um, of the USA. Americans rebelled against the British. The foundation of the USA came about when the early settlers of, the, of what was then in North America, the early settlers in the area of the USA rebelled against the British, they got, rebelled against their own kin and kin from England and Wales and Scotland, and they fought a war of liberation under the, under the slogan, no no taxation without representation. In other words, it was all about representation. Responsible representation is the heart and soul of the USA being. And the, the very name of Menasha represents this principle. So that is another why, why, reason why Menasha represents the USA. We also have the very name America. America is named after Mechia, the son of Menashe. The son of Menashe was named Mechia. The firstborn son of Menashe is named Mechia. He is mentioned in the Bible. He's mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, for instance, and he's mentioned in the book of Chronicles. He was the firstborn son of Menashe, Mechia. And uh, Mechia is a Hebrew name, and you also have ha Mechiri, a Mechiri in the plural. Hamechiri in the plural in Hebrew, in Biblical Hebrew means the people of or belonging to Mechia. In the Middle Ages in southern France, what is now southern France, in the region of Narbonne, there was once a Jewish prince who had autonomy over the area, and he was important. He was important in the time of Charlemagne, the early, in the early time of the creation of the French entity of the French, France as, a, as, a, as an independent country, as a country in the modern sense. 
So this uh, noble, this Jewish noble, this personal personage who was a Jewish religious person, he also had uh, power in the area. He was a local count or potentate, and uh, he in Hebrew is known as Mechia. And he's written about in songs, chansons in the local in the region of southern France, and he is also famous in northern Italy in that region. And legends were spoken about him, and some uh, a lot of versions he is uh, identified as a Christian. But uh, recent research has shown has verified that he's in fact a Jew, a local Jew, who is also spoken about in Jewish chronicles. In the Jewish chronicles, they refer to him as Mechia or Hamechiri. Hamechiri, literally the men belonging to Mechia, but they apply this. This uh, this uh, appellation to him, because uh, in the Hebrew of the time it was uh, as if to say a kind of nickname, as if the little mechia, a diminutive, is a is a term they use for 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 mechia itself. So um, in the Hebrew he's known as Hamachiri, which was a nickname for someone from Mechia, but literally in Biblical Hebrew it means a man of or belonging to Mechia. Um, and uh, he was also written about in, and, uh, in local legends and in local songs and, chronic and, and Christian chronicles. But they, um, they changed his name because the Hebrew Mechia and Hamachiri is a bit difficult to apply for Western tongues, for people who speak Western languages. So they altered his name to America, or Americus. Uh, that is, that, in other words, in medieval Latin of the time, America, or Americus, was the equivalent of Hamachiri. This is documented, and it is annotated, it is notated, it is known. Uh, so that uh, America was the equivalent of Hamachiri. And uh, this name was in the region of that er of that time was uh, famous. It was well known. So other children, Christian children, were also given this name because the person, personage, is a Jewish origin. So were not recorded. Were not always known. Were not known to everyone. In some versions, he is uh, he is even considered a Christian saint, even though in effect uh, all of the stories about him derive from his Jewish personage named Machir, Hamachiri. And um, and eventually, America Vespucci, an Italian sailor, was also named after him. America Vespucci, he gave his name to America, according at least according to conventional accounts. We had Christopher Columbus who discovered America, but at first they thought, or they were not sure, they they were of the opinion that America would, would um, was part of Asia. So uh, a few years later, America was pushy, sailed around the area, mapped it, and he proved that America, North and South America, were separate continents. And he verified this, and he brought back maps, and these maps were drawn up by professional cartographers. And on the back of these maps, they wrote his name, America. Whether by design or by chance, this name America became applied to America. And when we say America, we, uh, in spoken language, we mean the USA. Um, uh, citizens, inhabitants of the USA are called Americans. They call themselves Americans. They say America and they mean the USA. Uh, the, the, uh, the terms America and USA are synonymous. They mean, have the same meaning. They're spoken in the tongue and even in the dictionary. So we may say that America, the word America, uh, through divine providence, was derived, or indirectly, is a derivation from the Hebrew Mechia or Hamechiri, meaning belonging to Mechia, and Mechia is the firstborn son of Manasseh. So Mechia itself was named after the firstborn son of Manasseh. Uh, what does Mechia mean? Mechia, the word Mechia in Hebrew has several meanings, but uh, one of them is. Uh, is the principle of capitalism. Mechia literally means uh, price or selling and uh, the principle of selling. In other words, the right of free to free enterprise. Free enterprise is the basis of capitalism and it is the basis of the USA. 
It is part of the world outlook. It is con commented, as if to say, with American democracy, with American thought processes. And Americans themselves identify with the, through the, with the heart and soul with this principle of capitalism and throughout the world America is identified with the principle of capitalism. And the very name America is derived from Mechir which in Hebrew, in the Hebrew tongue, may be considered to uh, mean the principle of capitalism. We also have the word Yank. Yank is a nickname for America. It is a nickname for an American. It is a nickname for uh, a citizen of the USA. Uh, it, within the USA itself, we have the Yanks, and they have the, the Confederates or the Reds, people from the South who fought against the people from the North in the American Civil War, and they applied the term Yank or Yankee to someone from the North. But nevertheless, in the modern terminology, at least in the in that of foreign people, foreigners, uh, apply the term Yank or Yankee to all people from the USA. And so Yank, Yankee has become a nickname for anyone from America. And the term Yank, uh, it, like, like other words, it has been given several possible de derivations, uh, sources of origin, and no one is quite sure. But uh, whatever its origin, Yank in uh, Hebrew, in the Hebrew of Ashkenazi of European Jews, is an equivalent of Jack. Jack is short for Jacob. Yank and Jack or Jacob are the same names. In other words, the Americans are nicknamed, have a nickname, which um, is another way of pronouncing the word Jacob. And it may. Well, be close to how the original word Jacob was pronounced in Biblical Hebrew. In Biblical Hebrew may well be, we're not sure because we have different uh, Hebrew dialects, it may well be that in a Biblical Hebrew the word Yaakov, or Jacob, was actually pronounced something close to Yanko, Yanko. So we have this Yank, or uh, the equivalent of Jack, or Jacob. And we have this name, which is give, nickname, which is given to Americans. And um, as we saw before, Manasseh was close to Jacob. Manasseh received fr directly from Jacob. Manasseh was placed on the right hand of Jacob, on the stronger side. Whereas Ephraim was on the left hand side of Jacob, but on the right hand side of Joseph as we remembered from the blessing. Here was Manasseh and here was Ephraim. Myself and project myself. In Hebrew, Manasseh was on the the here is Manasseh and here is Ephraim. Manasseh was on the right hand side of Jacob but, which is the left-hand side of Joseph. In other words, Manasseh received from the strongest heart in biblical thought of Jacob. He received more directly from Jacob, whereas uh, Ephraim received more directly from the Joseph aspects. And uh, this principle is reflected in the very name given to America, Yank, or given to Americans, Yank, Yankee. It's another way of saying Jacob. We another principle we have, or another point we have, may be considered maybe the presidential system of government. The presidential system of government is also an aspect of the American characteristics. It reflects something of American characters of an innate, inborn trait, and uh, we find that the system of government, the system of government in the biblical times was preceded in the, tri in the tribe of Manasseh, in the time of Manasseh. We have a, a, a writer, a Hebrew writer, Hebrew language writer, Rabbi R. M. Schlanger. He wrote a book concerning uh, the different tribes in Israel. 
and in his book he shows how we had amongst in the northern kingdom of Israel the northern kingdom was separate from the southern kingdom was separate from the kingdom of Judah the northern kingdom the northern entity was dominated by the tribes of Joseph Ephraim and Manasseh and they would appoint kings and uh, Arem Schlanger shows how these different kings who were appointed over the northern kingdom of Israel um, uh, also known as Samaria or as Joseph or as Ephraim and is given different terms but uh, this northern kingdom uh, received its monarchs, it had uh, monarchs taken from different tribes, the, the dynasties in the northern kingdom did not last long, and he points out that there were different types of kings who ruled over them. Usually, or nearly in every case in effect, he analyzes each and every king and he shows which ones derive from Manasseh, or pertain somehow or other to Manasseh, and which ones pertain to Ephraim. And he points out that those who pertain to Ephraim have more absolute unlimited powers, whereas those who pertain to Manasseh are appointed for limited purposes. And he gives us, uh, an, for example, Jehu ben Nimshi. Jehu ben Nimshi was uh, from the tribe of Manasseh, who pertained to Manasseh, and he was. Um, he was appointed for a specific reason. He was made king in order to take a vengeance on the house of Ahab and to uh, extirpate from the land the worshippers of the Baal. And his story is found in 2 Kings chapter 9. And he was appointed for a, for a specific reason. He was referred to as the the Tsar, the, uh, the prince. He was, uh, in other words, he was made king, but he was uh, given over to be king from uh, for a specific purpose. His powers of governance were not absolute. They were circumscribed by the terms of his appointment, and uh, he represents princes from Manasseh, according to Aram Shlango, goes through each and every case and shows how this principle applied. When the princes or the rulers of the northern kingdom of Israel came from Manasseh, they were given over to rule for specific reasons, with specific powers, and they were not absolute monarchs, not absolute rulers, and this is similar to the presidential system, when the president is appointed for specific, uh, prescribed period of time, and his powers are limited, the powers are, are wide, he has a, a great deal of authority, but he has, does not have absolute authority, his, his authority is defined and curtailed from the very beginning, and this king, whom, which is one of the examples he gives, is known as Yehu Ben Nemeshi.